here we go. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. Um, a little bit of a background on Fuse Project. It's been founded over 20 years ago. 50% uh, of our projects are done with startups. We've, done, we've worked with uh, as partners to startups with about 90 of them in the last 15 years. Um, we're an independent design firm. There's not many of those left. Uh, and we recognize globally. So we work on all kinds of projects from inventing the Samsung TV, Frame TV, which you see there, uh, the SNU robotic bassinet, uh, an EV car, which um, we launched a few, a few uh, months ago, or Herman Miller furniture. So my work in Fuse projects, you know, really comes from a deep belief that design accelerates the adoption of new ideas. And you know, we need to accelerate ideas that will bring fundamental change to health and wellness as well. And two reasons why I find this particularly relevant in healthcare is because the adoption, the adoption of new ideas and the pace of change in healthcare um, can lag behind other innovations um, that consumers experience every day. And hence comes that frustration, that uh, separation between what you experience uh, in front of a doctor or in a hospital um, compared to what you experience in an Apple store, for example. Um, and then the second reason is that design can have a dramatic and positive impact on people's physical health and mindset. Um, so, and I think that was talked about earlier by uh, Thomas Heatherwick as well. So I'm a practitioner of design and I'll share some actual projects, some actual um, uh, things that we have uh, created with our partners. Um, and what we do best is really to focus on entirely new to the world products and offerings. And this, this is really fun for me to be in this world because I never know what is the next thing we'll be, we'll be working on. So category you know, uh, innovations such as the Job on App um, and uh, uh, this new smart bassinet, for example, robotic companions such, such as LEQ and Moxie, which I will talk about today. And we do this work with three different types of players. One is large uh, corporate players like L'Oreal. This is a, a UV sensor um, that we launched with them. Uh, we partner with entrepreneurs and startups, as I mentioned. Um, and we have this model called Venture Design. And then we do, do a lot of social impact and public health um, uh, partnerships as well. So the two areas that um, I'll I'll, I'll use this lens to talk about the, the, you know, these, these projects is uh, designing at the, extreme, at, the, at the extremes of life. And so much of design addresses the comfortable middle part of life when we're uh, happy, healthy, um, when we have money. Um, but I think that you know, what people, you know, what, when people need it the most, um, is when people are rarely sort of designed for. Parents and babies, uh, the aging and the sick, kids with learning uh, challenges and mental health. Um, so for me, design is most needed when change is most extreme. And then the other sort of paradox or sort of extreme um, that I wanna to talk to about today is about uh, designing for emerging technologies and uh, especially in the age of uh, AI and robotics. So technology is way too often a distraction, especially the ones we have in our back pockets. And I'm really interested in technologies that partner with people and people's needs um, in a humanistic way. So the first one is called Moxie. It's an AI learning companion. And it was initially intended for kids with autism and on the spectrum. It's really a robot that helps um, with a child's social skills and their development needs. What happened is that it actually turned out to be incredibly useful for all kids. And we obviously saw that during uh, COVID um, where you know, very, you know, there was a lot less engagement and, um, and there was a withdrawal. So it helps you know, children build social, emotional, and cognitive skills. Um, and, you know, here you, one in five children are neurodivergent, um, but the results of Moxie, and I'll show you more about it, is that 71% um, of users of these kids uh, show improvements in social skills. 
And that means um, that encompasses communication, cooperation, assertiveness, responsibility, uh, social engagement, um, and self-control. So one of the big challenges from a design standpoint and something that we learned at the onset of the project with autism and spectrum specialists is um, kids on the spectrum react to very specifically to the eyes and hand movement. Um, so the larger the eyes, the more expressive you know, the eyes, um, the more hand movement, the more they will connect with, um, you know, with that person in front of them. Uh, but good luck making a mechanical robot with eyes that open up and closes. Um, that looks a little creepy anyway, but it's also very expensive and very complex to build. So, um, you know, the eyes and the face, the way we solved it is by creating a rather large head for this little guy um, and projecting from the inside uh, onto this curved face-like surface. Um, and um, that, was, that was a bit of an engineering feat. So I'm gonna show you um, quickly what Moxie does and how it reacts. We have some in our office, I have some at home. So the first one is a video of just somebody talking with Moxie, which I actually enjoy doing once, you know, once in a while. Um, and then the other one is actually Moxie playing with my kids. Fantastic. The car just sent me a really cool fun fact, and I'd like to share it with you. An octopus has three hearts. I thought that was interesting. Did you? Yeah, that was really interesting. I didn't know that. That's awesome. That's okay. I know lots of other facts. Do you want to hear another? Why do I what? Um, I want to, ah, well. I missed the other ones, but the other one, the other video is uh, essentially my, my daughter dancing with Moxie, and then after that there's another one where they're doing some meditation as well. So this one um, called LEQ is a project about, it's a robot companion for the aging. So it's completely at the other end of the spectrum here. Um, it's addressing aging and isolation. Um, it's made of two parts. One is an emotive persona, which uh, you see on the left, which we kept a lot more, a lot less humanoid-like, a lot more face-like, but with some expression. And what it does is that it reacts to somebody entering the room or leaving the room. It, it starts conversations. It's not just, uh, it doesn't just respond to a, a prompt, it engages. Um, and then the other one is a portable screen on the right. Um, and what was, you know, what, what's, what's um, you know, fascinating and the reason for this project is that half of seniors, of older adults, live alone and they, they, they're, half of them feel lonely. 75% of seniors also don't feel comfortable with modern technology. Um, you know, it's really how to reach others. It's too complicated, it's too complex. So the question we wanted to answer here is, you know, how do aging adults stay connected to the world uh, when cognitive functions are diminishing, when technology is complex and intimidating, and also when friends and family uh, may not be, you know, right around the corner. And so this is one of these projects where we could have made anything. We could have uh, put a little robot on wheels that kind of follows the aging people around. When we showed that, they hated it. Um, they, f they find it creepy. They wanted a table object. This is really addressing the specific audience. They want an object they can leave in the kitchen or uh, maybe in the, um, uh, in the living room, certainly not in the bedroom. So, um, so, so we had to invent this robot that is animated, that has movement, um, as well as uh, a secondary screen onto which more information can be, uh, can be displayed. So I'll show you a couple of videos. This is, this is more of a promotional video, but then I'll show you um, one in the, um, in the real home. Hi, Walter. Would you like to hear something interesting? Yeah, sure, why not? There are only 18 minutes of total action in an average baseball game. Betcha didn't know that, right? I did not know that. So this is, this is one of our uh, early test folks. I mean, it's now in thousands of homes, but uh, it was tested for about 18 months. Um, and um, this is one of the beta users. LEQ is a presence, 
I feel that there's somebody nearby with whom I can communicate. I can turn to her any time. So our next uh, recent, very recent project is called Cyanic, and um, it's a neural sleeve. Um, so it's really a first of its kind healthcare product. It's at the intersection of, of wearable design, but also AI, data, and, and the human body. So what it does is it improves mobility uh, for stroke recovery patients, for example. Um, people with multiple sclerosis, cerebral, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injuries, um, and other neuromuscular diagnoses. And what, um, what you see in the, in the United States is that 14% um, of, of, of people in the US are living with some type of mobility impair impairment. Um, and the way it works is it delivers electrical simulation to activate the correct muscles. What happens is the, you know, your, your body is functioning perfectly fine. Your muscles are there, but the brain has forgotten how to fire them. That happens, for example, in a stroke. Um, and so what it does, it's, it's, it's using personal algorithms to uh, deliver this, um, this electrical current um, in, you know, in, in two electrodes that are placed inside the, inside the sleeve. So it requires a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of coaching, and a lot of customization, which uh, AI really allows us to do. The results are absolutely incredible. 94% have uh, shown improved ease of walking, uh, improved strength, and improved uh, ra uh, range of motion. And it's really facilitating muscle relearning. Uh, and another thing, because I've done a few FDA products that was extraordinary, is that it got approved in about three months, um, which um, I think is a record. And here I'll show you um, uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Robinson, the founder, uh, just saying a few words about, about the project. When someone has a mobility difference, there's this feeling like I'm being taken care of or that like people have to wait for me. What we really want is for them to be able to be living in the moment and being able to engage with their community and their loved ones in a way that doesn't feel like they are being taken care of, but really feels like they're independent and part of that experience. So one of my best friends uh, sent me a text about two weeks ago. It had about 15 exclamation points on it. Um, his father had a stroke three months ago. Um, they put the, he couldn't walk, so you reduced to a wheelchair. Um, and they put the cyanic sleeve on, on him, and he was walking. He sent me a video. Um, it, it truly changes lives. But designing for the body and for co comfort, um, as well as these components, is um, very complex. Um, also, designing for being able to put it on and off when part of your body may be uh, paralyzed or constrained is, um, is also you know, very difficult. So uh, the goal here was, was to get away from the stigma, get away from the medical device, make it look like, you know, you see these tennis players that have these very cool you know, knee braces and whatnot, make it look like mo more like a lifestyle um, that accompanies you on this journey, which, which is really the, the journey of an extreme athlete to get back into you know, shape, to get back to walking, to get back of moving. The last project I'm gonna share in this category of projects is um, one of my favorites. It's the SNU robotic bassinet. Um, it's popular pretty much all over the world. There is not a week that comes by where I'm sending somebody across the world a, a discount, one of my friends who are having babies. Um, and, um, this is also my son in one of the early designs. Um, so what it does is that it keeps babies asleep and um, it also allows for the parents to, to, uh, to stay asleep longer. And it's used for the first six months um, after birth. 25% of parents, um, men and women actually, um, uh, experience postpartum uh, anxiety which leads to exhaustion, illness, marital conflict, higher healthcare costs. Um, and then, unfortunately, there is also SIDS, Sudden uh, Infant Death Syndrome, which affects 3,500 
uh, babies in the US uh, a year and, uh, and a large amount in the UK as well. So this was a very paradoxical idea. I think uh, Thomas earlier said that also people always ask him, what are you working on next? What's the next thing that you wanna do, that you wanna work on? And so for about five and a half years, which is how long it took to develop this project, um, people would ask me, what's exciting? What are you working on? And I would tell them I'm working on a robot that will take care of your baby. <laughs> and the reaction was universal. And I loved, you know, kind of getting that reaction was like, oh, I would never use that. That's completely dystopian. Um, I had an absolute no on this idea. Uh, of course, I knew we were designing it to be a beautiful object in the home, to not look like a robot, uh, to be you know, very safe for, for your kids, and also very beautiful. It had to be designed to fit. Um, so this is Dr. Harvey Karp, with whom I partnered. Um, he's a 70-plus-year-old uh, pediatrician, um, so not your typical startup founder. Um, and he dedicated his life to solving the parent sleep problem. Uh, his method called the five S's, the happiest baby five S's, um, basically triggers five reflexes that replicate the environment of the womb to help a newborn sleep better. So there is swaddling, there is shushing, uh, which is the noise that uh, reminds them of uh, being in the womb. There is swinging, movement is very important. Um, and in U.S. Uh, state hospitals, it's the leading method. In the U.S. Army, it's the leading method that, that is being taught. Um, 30 different countries around the world use it. And he was a, essentially a best-selling author and, um, you know, would be on Oprah all the time, etc. But um, he's so good at doing that method. And I tried it with my first few kids. Um, I was using it. But when it's the middle of the night and you're tired, you know, you don't, it really requires to be superman or superwoman um, to really apply this method. So we try to take Harvey and turn it into a robot. And how, that's how the snoo came about. So I'm going to show you something now that can be a little um, hard to take, a little difficult. Um, crying babies, probably the worst noise, that, 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 um, the, the number one noise we hate. But I promise you it will be short. And so these babies are angry. Their faces are red. They're, they've been crying for a while. They're, this is, and I'll show you this video in real time. Um, what, what will happen is the AI in the SNU uh, recognizes the kind of fussing, the kind of screaming, is it a lot, is it a little, and starts to create the noise and create the movement that responds to uh, the baby's um, you know, current state. So you can hear kind of the rain of this thing. I said, they're angry, right? And now the motion's going to start. So the movement is starting. The sound. I'm getting the four of the So a couple of them are starting to fade. resisting down here on the right hand side. Good night. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. For a parent, this is the uh, sweetest, most beautiful moment. Um, whoops, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> so uh, the SNU is also in 200 uh, hospital uh, NICUs uh, currently. Clinical studies have shown that um, NICU nurse staff are saving about an hour uh, per shift, uh, which is enormous. Um, and uh, because uh, babies can, uh, I mean, sleeping babies obviously don't need to be taken care of and they can focus on mo the more critical uh, care ones. Um, 
that's, and then the, we, the other thing we have done, we've increased accessibility of the product with a rental program, which is about $4 a, a night. It's also a benefit in a lot of companies today, whether you're at Google or Activision or at Fuse Project, uh, you get a snoo when, you, when a baby uh, arrives. Um, and it's been five years since the launch. We've had over 400 million, 400 million hours of baby sleeping in the snoo. Uh, we've had no SIDS occurrence, which we anticipated but never spoke about uh, until now. And snoo is the first and only medical device that has received a label from the FDA for its ability to keep sleeping babies safety on their backs and hence avoid SIDS. Um, so I believe even your royals uh, have a couple of the snooze. No photos, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll share uh, very quickly two new projects um, uh, which address mental health and habits. The Opus Soundbed, um, on the left, and uh, Open Seed Meditation Pod on the right. So the Opus Sunbed uses uh, vibrations and um, uh, physical vibration and sound uh, to deliver low frequency vibrations throughout the body. And it creates a quick release of stress and it puts you in a state of meditation. I kind of call it meditation for dummies. You know, sometimes the discipline, the distractions, uh, the apps, all of that tends to be, um, you know, sometimes in the way. So here you get into a meditative journey. There's lots of different programs, different length from seven minutes to 40 minutes. Um, and it really sort of starts your day or ends your day in this, um, in this beautiful way. It's actually foldable. The triangles, the reason for the triangles is there is uh, vibration coming uh, out of um, um, each of the each each of those. It's actually a fairly large component. And then the second one is, you know, as we have heard, meditation benefits are well established. It's the meditation pod. Uh, it's designed for corporate offices and hospitals and co-working spaces, um, and uh, it allows companies to really elevate well-being. Um, and to allow people to go for a 15 minute meditation or so um, in, a, in an environment that's sort of beautiful with good sound, good lighting, and they can isolate themselves in there. So finally, and it's been talked about today as well, I'll talk about design of spaces, um, which is what we experience when we you know, visit hospitals, clinics, and labs. They don't look like that. They should look like that, as Thomas said earlier. Um, it's a whole area of design where, uh, you know, the consumers are used to a space that re reflects the service and the care that's being uh, given to them and something that's mostly evading healthcare uh, so far. Hopefully we will see that change. So this is a book I published uh, with Thames and Hudson, your local global publisher here in London. Um, I often replace the word design with intent or purpose, and for me, design is the first sign of human intent. And I think with this future of new technologies and new, new, new human needs, um, you know, design can accelerate the answers um, by remaining humanistic and address the critical health paradoxes that we need to tackle in the coming years. Thank you very much.